Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the, uh, the September Inspiration Hour. We're very excited to have you. We've had a nice break over the summer, and now we're starting our Inspiration Hours back up again. So um, my name is Tara Mastel, and I work for Montana State University Extension, and I work in the community development area. We're transitioning to call ourselves Community Vitality. What we do in extension with in this area is we focus on rural community vitality. We manage the reimagining rural program. We run programs that help leaders in our small towns gain skills so that they are um, can be even more effective in helping bring things into their community. Today, my co host will be Jennifer Anderson, and she is coming to us from another meeting. So she'll be joining us. Uh, Jennifer Anderson is uh, the extension agent in Rosebud and Treasure Counties. And this whole idea for having this inspiration hour was Jennifer's idea. And I thought it was a really great idea. So we're, um, we've been having these sessions over the last year as we transition. Our inspiration hours are really designed for rural leaders, people that are volunteers that want to make something happen. Because we've heard from a lot of folks all over the state that are saying, hey, we were trying to hire a teacher, but there's nowhere to live. So how can we work on housing? We've got this old building downtown. What do we do? What's our first step? So that's kind of what we've been doing. We've been bringing information to people on what's the very first step that you need to do and like what what's possible and what do you do first and who can you call for help? So that's what inspiration is all inspiration hour is all about. We, it really is coming out of the reimagining that program, which we run with our partner, Montana Community Foundation. Uh, we're going to be announcing uh, reimagining world dates at our next session, which is um, happening in October, October 18th. Okay, welcome, Jennifer. I just did a little introduction. Do you want to have any comments about our topic today? Uh, walking trails, bringing walking trails, and what to do, how to get started on walking trails. Um, thanks, Tara. I'm just happy to be here. Happy to um, be listening and learning with the rest of the folks. Um, I think this is a topic that's come up with our communities across the state, and um, it seems like a daunting task. So the, I think the more opportunity we have to learn, um, the better equipped we'll be to take on developing trails. So happy to be here, happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. So we're hoping, so we have three really great speakers today. And what I hope you take from this is that you can listen to the speakers, kind of understand what they have done and get a sense of the first step that you might be able to take and who you can call for help, who you can call for more um, information. So with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker our first speaker is Julie Riley. She's a colleague of Jennifer's and I's within Extension. Um, Julie works in Powder River County in Southwest, Southeast Montana in the community of Broadus. Julie works with community volunteers and has helped establish a school community development council, a local community foundation, a recycling center, and Julie works on the walkable community and trail system in Powder River County. So we're really excited to have Julie here to talk about what she has accomplished. And uh, I will just say Julie does not have a background in trails that I know of. <laughs> so um, I think it's a great um, exam. She can speak for um, somebody just digging in and getting started on trails. Before we get started, Julie, if I could just um, mention that if anybody has any technical challenges, I would ask that you please send a private message to my colleague Sharon Henderson. Sharon is um, she's with us and she's she works with us in the community vitality program and she's on campus in Bozeman and she's ready to help with any technological issues. You can send her a private chat or you can um, you can send her an email too if you have that. I'll put it in the chat. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Share the PowerPoint. Uh, so my name is Julie Riley. As uh, Tara said, I've been a half-time Montana State University Extension agent in Broadus in Powder River County for over 30 years. 
In 2015, we were part of a Cornell and Montana State University research project designed to improve cardiovascular health. As part of that program, we were asked to develop a community project to help residents make the healthy choice the easy choice. To change the infrastructure to encourage healthy habits like walking, biking, and healthy eating. Our group chose to install lighting and benches along the trail to the river to encourage and promote walking. So the Powder River Trails organization began. So first, a little bit about Broadus. We're located in Montana's southeast corner, 90 miles from Mount City, Montana, Belfouche, South Dakota, and Gillette, Wyoming. The major highways, 59 north and south, and 212 east and west intersect at Broadus. An average of 3,000 cars and trucks pass through our community each day. Just 445 people live in Broadus, an additional 1,300 live in Powder River County. We have more cows than people, with a ratio of about 50 cows for every person. 65% of the land is in private hands, and 35% is public land, primarily BLM and Custer National Forest. Agriculture, outdoor recreation, such as hunting and guiding for deer, elk, antelope, and turkey, oil production, and government agencies make up our economy. So first, let's define trail. What image comes to mind when you think of a successful trail? People have different images for what it means to have or build a successful trail. Is it a sidewalk that connects the school to the downtown? An asphalt trail to the river? Maybe a mown path through the trees? Curb extensions and lower speed limits to make the community more walkable. In rural communities across Montana, it's all of the above. Funding a trail is a huge part of trail building. I'll share with you our trail projects and some of the funding sources. So one of our best sources of funding is our local community foundation, the Powder River Community Endowment Fund. With these funds, we built a trail with fitness stations on private property. We installed interpretive signs sharing local history with financial assistance from Reimagining Rural. We sponsored a design contest, created and then hung decorative banners along the trail. We installed outdoor musical instruments, a story walk, and bike racks. And with private funds, we installed memorial benches along the trail and around town. With money from Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and the Recreational Trails Program, we built a trail to connect a neighborhood community to the FIT Trail. With Montana Department of Transportation funding, we will resurface the asphalt trail from the downtown to the river. This trail was actually built in 2006 when the Department of Transportation was rebuilding the highway through town. We promoted trails by organizing events, including a Freedom Run, the Still I Walk for Mental Wellness, and the Moonlight Walk. So if you want to build a trail, who's going to lead the effort? For us, it started with a group interested in, in improving our community's health by building a more active and bicycle-friendly and walkable environment. I'd like you to put in the chat box your answers for who should be at the table, who should be part of the group to build trails and walkable communities. See if I can see them. Youth. I like that youth and everyone. So community members, yep, and better access to the outdoors. Yep. Those are excellent examples, and you're absolutely right. Community group leaders. Public works. Yep. So I just want to add private landowners. Absolutely. So I just want to um, uh, tell you the people that 
all of those, yes, you're absolutely right. But also the people in power absolutely should be at the table. People such as county commissioners and the clerk and recorder, the mayor and town council. These people have access to funding, the authority to approve or disprove the location of a trail, grant requests, and maintenance agreements, maintenance agreements that are often needed to receive grant funding. It's challenging to sell building trails to local governments when they're worried about building bridges, maintaining roadways, building a healthcare clinic, uh, a nursing home, or building sewer and water projects. So if you want to build trails, you really must know and promote the economic benefits of building trails. The other group who should be asked early to the table and often are city and county maintenance personnel. For us, these were the most vocal people against trail building. We should have had them at the table and had those crucial convers and difficult conversations. I encourage you to invite them and the discussion and discourse from any potentially opposing groups. You'll have a much stronger community-wide successful effort by talking early and often. Trail building and community development is about building connections and relationships in small communities. I'd also encourage you to join state organizations and attend conferences related to building trails in more walkable communities. There's a huge number of people across the state who want to work with you and fund your walkable community or trail. We met people like Kathy Kostakis with Building Active Communities Initiative and Taylor Lonsdale with the Western Transportation Institute. They helped us learn about resources on both the state and federal level. They encouraged us to apply for technical assistance from National Park Service. With the National Park Service, we were funded for one year of technical assistance. With their help, we created a walking map with routes. We obtained access through school property to create a trail loop through the cemetery. We learned that we couldn't have access on private land for a looped trail from the river. We learned how to build trails with the contour of the land, and we learned about signage to mark the trails. My role as Montana State University Extension Agent was key in building trails because as, as an extension agent, I could use my time and resources to manage the Powder River Trails organization, apply for grants, and work closely with the volunteers and community. It's helpful to have someone in the community who is paid by a government agency just to help manage the process. Often we build trails for the most able. One day, each of us will or may need assistive devices, or we may need to sit and rest before continuing our journey. I encourage you to build trails that are accessible for many and keep people who need assistance in mind. Of course, building trails or an active infrastructure that promotes walking or biking takes time. It's a slow process to change transportation policies, apply for funding, or build support for trails. We are building a more active infra infrastructure for the next generation. It takes time, but it's well worth the walk. It's well worth the ride. Good. That's great, Julie. Thank you so much. That's really um, such a great presentation. Um, at this time, I'd like to open it up for questions for Julie. I see a few Boulder people on on the line. Do we have any questions from Boulder or Whitehall or any any folks? Um, you can enter your questions in the chat. Do you have any questions for Julie? Jennifer, was there anything that came to mind for you when Julie was talking? Oh, so there's a question on there from the panel. I don't know if you want to do yeah, or the yeah. chat. Do you want to do that one first? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. So as far as what we applied for, it's just as I can remember, it's just called a technical assistance grant and we applied for it and it's just a year of help in whatever form. And the person came up from Colorado, uh, maybe a half a dozen times and worked with us closely, you know, organizing a community meeting, uh, thinking about talking with us about our ideas, 
again, sharing, helping us figure out signage and where to go. And he even met with us with the school board uh, to present trails and, and why they're important to the community. And that trails won't. Uh, I think the school was concerned that you might get people on the trails that they didn't want by their schools. I, I think the whole, oh, people get concerned about trails in the community because they think it will encourage oh, people they don't want. <laughs> so we tried to say, you know, actually more trails will help. He also told us as we were busy uh, building garbage, or putting garbages in along our trail, and he said, uh, people don't have the garbage, it's cars that have the garbage. So we quit putting garbages in. He did, he taught us a lot, I guess, in that year that he was with us. Mm. And that's, so that's a technical assistance from the National Park Service. I'm guessing, yeah, that was the question. What technical assistance did you get from National Park Service? Great, great. Any, any other questions? Okay, well, we, Oh, there's, um, there is some more questions on there, Tara. I don't know if you want to do them. If you want to oh, take care of questions. Them. Yeah, let's do that. So we, um, yeah. Okay. So Debbie from Boulder is saying, I don't have any questions. Just very interesting. Julie, Michelle Anderson. She's also from Boulder. We have a plan ready for 5 years, but it's stuck in bureaucratic red tape, mainly the city attorney getting the paperwork pushed through. Our city council talks about getting the attorney going on it, but so far they haven't. What can we do about that? Tom is a great person to answer all of those questions. <laughs> As our, our probably will be our next speaker. Yes. Okay. So um, maybe. Um, yeah, I can take a shot. Um, I think it sounds like if the if the plan is ready and there's uh, five years uh, looking ahead, it sounds like a lot of work has already been done, which is great. And yeah, your looks like right at kind of that window where you want to push it through. Um, I would, I would encourage, uh, the local trails group and, and the, those that were involved with developing this plan to, to write, um, a concerned, uh, letter to the city council, uh, to apply potentially some, some public pressure. Um, and also just show how many folks in the community want this to happen. If you can somehow come up with a number or, um, a group of folks that all want to sign off on a letter of support to show that there's a large voice in the community saying that that trails plan wants to get passed so that work can start getting done and ground could get broken um, and new trails can be built. I think that would uh, applying some some public awareness to the situation is probably the, the best approach. Thank you, Tom. Um, let's just go with the questions here. So we have another speaker that is. I don't see them joining us. So, and I've texted and, and emailed and um, so I'm, we might just have two speakers today. Um, so let's just take some time and answer these questions because I know they're gonna help more than the person. That's how it goes with questions. If you have the question, there's a, always somebody else that also is curious about that. So Shiara is asking, Shiara from Whitehall is asking, is there an entity that would be able to help with logistics for placement in the community? Do you, we'll just open it up to Tom to Thomas with Fish Wildlife and Parks <laughs> and Julie. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, well, well, one, uh, it would be important to get everybody who's involved at the table to understand kind of what the different land ownership categories are, how much of it's happening on public land, whether that's state, county, or city. Um, or, and then also if there are private, uh, landowners involved and encouraging of this. Um, so I think getting folks together is, is the 1st, um, step and then having that group kind of lay out the, the logistics of the different jurisdictions would start. And then um, uh, in my role as the recreation and trails coordinator for. Fish, wildlife, and parks. Um, I could be a resource that comes in uh, once certain information is gathered and put into place, and kind of the scope, the the initial broad scope of the project is put in. Um, then, in my role, I can provide technical assistance to start uh, paring down the project into smaller pieces and see, you know, where is going to be the easiest place to start. 
uh, and then what's more of a long-term goal that's going to take more coordination and agreement and approval over time. Um, so uh, there's that. There's also the Montana Trails Coalition that has a lot of information and technical assistance on their website. Um, and then the Montana Access Project as well. Great, thank you. So, so Tara, I, I was just going to say, maybe that's a, I think that's a good question for Julie. Like how, because I wonder sometimes, does it just happen organically? Is it where people are, are already walking anyway? Or is it, is there a targeted area? So like Julie, when you guys were starting your, when you started your project, was there, did you have a, a route picked out to begin with? Or how did you come up with where your trails went? Um, so what we really wanted was to have a loop back from the river, right? Because we walked down to the river, so we just wanted to not walk the same trail back. But, um, and we thought we were pretty close in working with private landowners in getting a yes, we could go on their land. And then it turned out that they did not want it. So uh, then we like with the fit trail, that landowner, it wasn't a lot of land that we're working with. He was people walked up there anyway, like you said, and so he was very open to allowing us to be up there and that's it's a little bit hard with. Um, putting applying for grants for land on private property as I am like with the fish, wildlife and parks recreational trails program. I mean, they don't they don't want to give funding. I don't believe to. Uh, on private land, if you don't have a long term easement on there, I, I believe, right, Tom? Um, so it, it's difficult, it's a challenging process trying to go to do that. So, low, more low hanging fruit is public land, public accessible land. That is maybe not, I mean, would that be a good? Yeah, so I, I met with some say? folks in Big Timber earlier this summer. And uh, a, a large group of us got together from a bunch of different organizations and talked about kind of big picture. What does the community want to have happen over time? Um, and there's a lot of different trail projects and a lot of ways to connect the golf course to the fairgrounds, to a city park, um, and then a, a, like a, a nice walking path along along the highway that right now doesn't doesn't have anything. Um, and so it was really easy to throw out all of those ideas. But then once we got and, and backpedaled a little bit to say, okay, where do we start? What we realized was the best place to start was at yeah, one landowner area. So we decided city park was probably the, one of the city parks was probably the best place to start because you only need approval from, from one entity. And that would have been the city of Big Timber. Um, whereas some of the other projects you needed approval from the golf course, from Montana Department of Transportation, and then from um, the county where certain uh, land jurisdictions lie. So I think the, yeah, um, the best way to start, Jennifer, is what you, what you said, an area that's kind of confined with one land ownership so that you get that one approval, have that success and go from there. And then that success you can build on by encouraging other landowners and other groups to be coordinated and get that approval and then go bigger um, throughout time. I, Tara, I have another question and I'm sorry, right. I'm meaning to. We have, um, we have one, okay. one in the wrap, but go ahead. Okay, so my next, my question to Julie again is, you have an, or you stated you have an organ, overall organization, the Powder River Trails Organization. How can you expand a little bit on that? Like, how did the organization come about? Is it a 501c3? Like, um, how much authority do they have? And I know I heard you say this already that you're kind of the manager of it as the extension agent. That's something you've taken on as your duties. But can you just tell us a little bit more about that organization? Because I think a lot of our small towns probably don't have a trails group. So that even is something, a task that I think a lot of us would have to take on. Yeah. And and so I'm not saying that this is the right way, right, to do it, but I'll just how we did it uh, with that research project that we were part of. They encouraged us to set up a charter organization. So we're just, we have a charter. And because I'm part of, because Extension Service is part of the county government, then all of our grants go through the um, clerk and recorder of the county government, which is really nice okay. to have someone manage that. 
Um, now, as I look, because I don't you know, like I've been here 30 years, right? So I don't know how much longer I have with you with here. So I'm a little concerned about when I leave. So what happens with that organization and some of the money that we've and the projects that we have out there? I'm not sure where that will go. So long term, perhaps a 501c3 might be a better uh, avenue to go. But for us, it was simply a charter organization with extension service being the lead person and working with the clerk and recorder with the financial part. Okay, Thank you. Just, just have an update. So um, our, our next speaker, we had um, Diane Conradi from the Montana Access Project. Um, she, she was planned as a speaker and she would, had a something come up. So she's, she's still gonna come. But Tom, I think maybe we'll have you go next and then she can um, be, we'll just swap you out. Is that, is that all right with you? Yep, that works great. I okay. will uh, share my screen. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna check our time. So we're 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 doing we're doing pretty good on time, and I'm looking at questions here. The recording we have this pretty nifty um, group of recordings for our inspiration hour and I'm gonna put that in the chat right now so you if you haven't been to one of these before maybe you can find something there that's interesting but we have quite the playlist of the other inspiration hour um, conversations that we've had so um, I'm going to um, we're watching the questions and we'll try to get to everybody's question but right now we'll turn it over to um, Tom and I'll do an introduction for you. Uh, Tom, Tom Lang was highly recommended by uh, Julie and others to be a speaker on this topic because he's very, very knowledgeable. Tom Lang works with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks Recreation. He is the Recreation and Trails Coordinator. He administers the Montana Trails Stewardship Grant Program. He's going to talk about the program that he manages and some funding opportunities. So I'm um, excited to have you, Tom. Take it away. Thank you, Tara. Um, thank you for having me today. So I'm excited to share some information about um, how you can uh, attain access or funding to uh, improve uh, trail networks in your community. Um, in this presentation, I'm quickly going to go over program overview. Uh, I'll talk about project eligibility, uh, what the award and match requirements are within the Trail Stewardship Grant Program. Uh, we'll go over application details and cover some of the questions that would be asked and, and the information that uh, is best to include. And then I'll end by sharing an example project. So the Trail Stewardship Program was created in 2019 with the passing of Senate Bill 24. Um, it was done so that the state of Montana could have its own state funded trail program, uh, grant program to support uh, local community projects. Uh, for a long time, the state has had the recreational trails program, which Julie alluded to and uh, Powder River Trails had <clears throat> been able to access funding. And that's a trail grant program that's been around for uh, 30 plus years that gets money from federal highways. Um, because it's federal money, there's a lot more uh, requirements uh, and uh, regulations tied to that money. And so the state trails uh, program of trail stewardship was created uh, to make it a little bit easier for communities to access funding to do a lot of the same trail development and maintenance work. Um, it funds motorized and non-motorized trail improvement projects. And since 2001, uh, it has awarded 3.6 million to 104 projects across Montana um, for an average of roughly $34,000 in award. Um, and that ranges though, we've had awards that ask for about $7,000 and awards that ask for $75,000. Um, and we'll go over uh, those ranges and the award amounts uh, in a little bit of detail in a few slides. 
Uh, so when it comes to project eligibility, eligible organizations, local governments, tribal governments, school districts, uh, recreational clubs and organizations, and 501c3 nonprofits. Um, and when it comes to eligible projects, we have rehabilitation and maintenance of existing trails. Um, so you could have a trail uh, right now in a local park and it just really would need some uh, updating and, and tread work. Um, and it could use some improvements to put maybe a shade shelter in or a picnic bench along it uh, or some new signage. Um, so that is all eligible. Uh, also new trail and path construction. Um, so if there's an area in your community where uh, you would like to formally establish a new trail that didn't previously exist, whether it's to uh, improve access to a certain area or landscape, or whether it's to connect um, aspects of the community like a park with a neighborhood or um, the river closer to the downtown, um, you, blazing those new trails and, and that development is, is also eligible. Um, and then third, uh, trail side and trail head facilities construction. So uh, this could be putting in an entirely new parking lot area um, to a trail that you want new visitors to come in. Uh, this would include uh, paving. It could include in, including uh, and adding vault toilets. It could include uh, dealing with um, uh, solid waste in, in putting in a, um, a trash station. Um, and it also eligible projects and eligible funding can also align with any contracted services that this would come through, whether it's uh, a contractor to build the new trail or to um, pick up the garbage on a weekly basis and uh, to uh, fabricate new signs and uh, fence posts and what have you. And so rehabilitating existing trails, uh, building new trails, and then enhancing trailheads and trailside facilities are all eligible projects. Um, so when it comes to the award and match requirements of the trail stewardship program, the maximum award is $75,000. Uh, and of that 7% can be included for administrative costs, um, which is, a, which can be a huge advantage because write, grant writing and all of the work of coordinating and organize, organizing folks before you even apply um, is, is time consuming and it's labor intensive. Um, and so administrative costs that are uh, encountered throughout the management of the grant, uh, such as accounting and um, submitting for reimbursement grants, because this is a reimbursement uh, program, uh, all of those uh, administrative overhead costs uh, of up to 7% of the award can be associated to that work. Uh, when it comes to the match, it's 10% uh, of the project uh, total project cost. So uh, a grant award for $30,000, the match would be 3,000. Um, and that match can be met in, in a few ways, through in-kind labor or in-kind donation of materials uh, and or a cash match. Uh, when it comes to in-kind labor, uh, it can be a full in-kind 10% match. Um, and so volunteer hours uh, within the program are counted at a rate of $25 an hour. Um, so if you did get awarded a $30,000 grant and you have a 10% match, um, but you don't have cash or materials on hand to donate to the project, however, you do have a large group of volunteers who are dedicated to the carrying out this project, uh, they would be able to work uh, at a rate of $25 an hour. All of that volunteer log would be put together so in order to uh, reach that $3,000 uh, match requirement, you would need 120 hours of volunteer labor as an in-kind contribution to meet the match, um, which is a really nice feature of the Trail Stewardship Grant. You don't need cash on hand for the match. Um, it, it can come and, and can be donated by folks. Um, but if all you have is a dedicated group of folks willing to put their time and effort in, that labor can cover the match requirement, um, which, which really helps out. Um, so in terms of the application, uh, the 2024 cycle will open November 1st. 
uh, of this year, and it will run through January 15th of next year. Um, the application is done online, uh, and prior to its opening, there will be a lot of information on the Trail Stewardship webpage uh, on FWP's uh, general oversight uh, website. And then um, I will be releasing a technical assistance training in early November that walks applicants through uh, the full application and explains kind of what is expected and what's necessary when working through uh, the online grant application. Um, to give you an idea of what the application looks like, um, the application will kind of break down what the project looks like and also serve as a project management tool for you throughout the course of the project. And it will also allow you to explain the benefits of the project so that um, you can supply this information to the local newspaper and to anybody interested in what's what's going on with a trail development project. Um, so first you would want to explain the project overview and location. Um, you would clarify what type of project it is, whether it's uh, existing maintenance, or, uh, maintenance on an existing trail, uh, whether it's new trail development, or whether it's uh, trailhead or trail side development. Um, that you would then uh, specify whether it's a motorized, non-motorized project, or if it has aspects of both. Um, and then you would want to detail out the location, um, detail out who the landowners are, uh, include landowner agreement and approval uh, through written letters of support or providing uh, lease agreements or easement agreements, and then outline the physical traits of the location. Um, and so uh, this also kind of breaks down uh, the location, the overview, and then it, it shows kind of that this is a trail to promote public access to the outdoors through this uh, trail work. Um, the next section of the application would ask you to describe the project benefits, and those would fall into three categories. The first would be the recreational benefit. Um, so does this project improve public safety? Does it improve project uh, public health? Uh, does it improve uh, access to the outdoors? And does it potentially connect existing outdoor recreation facilities through the creation or development of this trail? Um, and any other recreational benefits that you could see, uh, the school programs could use it uh, for field trips or for uh, weekly activities uh, and things like that. Any community, um, any community benefits relating to the outdoor recreation components. Um, the next, uh, aspect of the project benefits would be for you to describe the project partners. Um, and the more partners involved, uh, the better. Uh, the more support that uh, local community organizations, uh, landowners, businesses are saying, um, that's great. You'll, you'll for sure have a, a core team of project partners who are uh, doing the planning, logistics, and implementation. Um, but this is also a way to say, we have our core team doing this work, and then we have a group that's also part of this project, more in a supportive and promotional standpoint. And, and you're able to kind of include all the different uh, community members and partners that are a part of it. And then the uh, final aspect of explaining project benefits would be to talk about the community and potential economic benefits of the project. Um, this could include ADA access uh, within the project and how that'll benefit members of the community. Uh, it can also talk about any local economic positive impacts that it will have, uh, whether it's uh, keeping folks that are visiting in town for a little longer so that they'll stick around and spend more money at local shops, um, or if uh, there are local businesses that are hugely supportive of this and, and willing to, to donate funds in order to, to make the project happen. Um, then you'll get to the heart of the application, which is the project implementation plan. Um, and, and part of this section is to explain early on how this project aligns with an existing goal or strategy uh, within the community, within the region, or within the, the state of Montana. And there's a number of plans and um, uh, 
uh, visions and guide type of documents that you can call from locally. You could have, uh, well, for example, it sounds like Boulder has uh, a plan that's been drafted and developed to talk about trail development. And so citing that plan in the project implementation section of the application shows that this aligns with community goals that have been uh, worked on and uh, brought together and, and approved. Um, regionally, uh, there could be something that um, uh, a local tourism group or a community economic development group is saying that in, in cruise, increasing outdoor recreation opportunities is a goal for Southeast Montana, for example, and, and then pointing that this project aligns with that. And then at the state level, uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, we have a, com a statewide comp comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. And getting familiar with that and seeing how your project aligns with the goals and strategies outlined in the statewide um, plan is really helpful in this section to kind of build that, that project justification. Uh, you would then talk about timeline and tasks of how this project would be carried out. And then within those tasks, you would also then want to talk about the workforce and, and who would be carrying this out. Um, and so part of the application process, therefore, is to kind of research who local contractors are in your area that might specifically do trail work. Um, and if they don't, there might be uh, different contractors out there that still have the equipment and could have the availability and willingness to do a trail project, even though uh, some of their work might not traditionally be in trails. Um, if they have the equipment and the willingness, um, they can be a qualified contractor and they can provide you with a bid for what this work might cost. Um, and then lastly, you're going to want to include what's the long term maintenance, um, because once this project is done, uh, you know, my program wants to know that we're investing in a project that's going to bring a direct benefit to the community but that also this investment is going to be cared for in the long term and that a long term maintenance plan is put in place so that the gains that are made within this project can stay. And so explaining that once the project is done, um, here's how we're going to upkeep these new improvements is a really important part of that implementation plan. Um, and lastly, you'll include your project budget which would include some of those bids. It would talk about any salaries or, or payrolls that you would want to be um, um, covered through this award. Uh, and then also any material costs uh, or rental equipment that might be needed to carry out the project. Um, and that would come through a budget table and then there would be an opportunity for you to have a budget narrative to detail out all, all of those um, requested funding items. Um, so to provide you with an example project, um, in our last cycle, the city of Fort Benton applied to uh, improve their levee trail, uh, which is right in the center of town next to the Missouri River. Um, and across the street is uh, the main strip of, of a lot of their local businesses. And so the levee trail um, prior to this project had been there uh, for a very, very long time. And the pavement was, was just old, uh, cracked in a lot of places. Uh, tree roots had come out and underneath it and made it uneven. Um, and certain areas were really narrow. Um, so the goal was to improve the surface of the area so it's easier for folks uh, to move along, widen the trail in certain areas so that um, large groups could pass comfortably by each other or folks with a stroller can pass and, and navigate um, easily. Um, and then also install uh, trash bins along the trail, uh, which was covered by the grant in order to uh, deal with any uh, solid waste issues. Um, and it was really for the benefit of local residents um, and also visitors to the community. Um, by fixing this trail, it invited visitors to, to stay longer and then invite and then, you know, would naturally have the effect of folks sticking around for lunch or um, staying a little bit longer in the day and potentially staying overnight, which I think is a, a big benefit for communities who, who want that type of uh, tourism and that type of revenue. An in-town trail can help uh, achieve that. And so um, 
this was a, this was a project that I went up to Fort Benton last summer, uh, met with some folks and talked about uh, what they envisioned happening with the trail. Uh, we covered some logistics of, of what it's going to take. Uh, they had said that um, what happened was this road crew that was out of Lewistown was in the area that was scheduled to do some work on a local highway uh, that had been scheduled out a year before. Um, and so uh, the mayor of Fort Benton, knowing that, uh, thought that if they if they were able to secure this grant, then that could be the contractors that would stick around for another week and, and provide this work and, and this benefit to the community and the service through uh, doing that work. And so it wasn't a, a necessarily a, a trail contractor who did the work, um, but it was a, a certified road crew that knew how to do this and were able to adapt to um, a new workspace and, and get the job done. Um, so uh, that's the trail stewardship program and a small example project of, of what came out, uh, of what can come out of this program. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, I'll pass it back over to Tara. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Okay. Um, let's see, does anybody have any questions for Tom about the grant program? or anything else. <laughs> it sounds like he's really uh, knowledgeable about trails in any regard. You can just type your comments in the chat. Michelle says, sounds like a dream come true if you're willing to work for it. Um, you know, while sometimes it takes a little bit for people to think and type into the chat, um, I'll just ask a question that was put in earlier. Tom, maybe you can suggest or anybody on the on the line. Can you recommend a good resource for writing grants on this subject matter? Because we're a lot of times dealing with small communities that don't have. Well, most communities don't have a grant writer. So any suggestions on that? Yeah, so uh, well, luckily in my role, part of my responsibilities is to provide technical assistance. Um, and so I can't write the grant for anybody, but I can walk through the application questions and uh, the you know, desired information and, and talk with potential applicants to uh, advise them on how to best answer uh, the questions in the application and what information is, is most helpful to include and, and also what information isn't helpful to include because I think that could be a challenge sometimes is figuring out what to keep in and what to keep out. Um, and so really when it comes to uh, the trail stewardship program, um, we want to we want to see ideally shovel ready projects um, that are once the award goes out that we can be confident that the project is, is going to be completed within a year or two. Um, sometimes that's not always the case because there are a lot of logistics with trail work, especially when you're going uh, a trail, which it normally does goes across different jurisdictions. Um, but working to uh, prepare a project and make sure that everything's in line and it is shovel ready uh, is really important. So um, explaining the workforce qualifications, uh, providing that community support. And then that section for project benefits is really to um, folks to kind of explain what are gonna be the, the bigger implications of the project, but the heart of the application really is that project implementation plan um, and allowing the review committee to have confidence in that implementation plan that if awarded, uh, things will be carried out and, and the, this uh, greater access to the outdoors will will be the result. Do you, do you think that somebody could do this without having a grant writer? Like can just your average person put something like this together? Yeah, so well, I'll stick with Fort, Fort Benton, for example. Um, the, the mayor there who I had worked with, he wrote the grant um, and I, I think maybe he had he had mentioned that he'd written a few grants before uh, in the past, but uh, by no means was he a, a professional grant writer. Um, and I think a lot of other community organizations, um, the East Ridge Foundation out of Butte, uh, they, and they're part of the Rotary Club there, they applied for and were awarded for a grant um, in the Modest Canyon Trail area. And 
that was a completely volunteer uh, driven organization and effort. Um, and I think the way that I designed the application is that it should be so intuitive that you don't need to be a, a seasoned grant writer. Um, you just need to be willing to get uh, the most relevant information and allow it all to kind of coalesce together so that the benefits can then lead into the implementation plan and then the budget can be realistic in relation to both. Um, and then uh, the whole project kind of comes together through the application uh, rather than you might see a, a federal grant. You know, if you were applying for this for a federal grant, the, the application might be 40 pages um, and ours isn't. And, and it's designed to to be the exact opposite of that, to be to be more accessible to, to communities, even if they don't have a, a designated trail organization or, or a parks and rec department. That's really nice to hear that. And I especially noted that you have you're including administrative costs as an allowable expense, which is huge. So you mm -hmm. if you're running an organization that's all volunteer, you can you have a little bit of wiggle room to maybe hire some of those more professional things out. Mm -hmm. And then also having low match is huge, huge because especially our remote rural communities, even the city and county governments don't have any. They don't have any extra, so mm -hmm. yeah, it's great to see. Any other yeah. questions or any comments, Jennifer? Anything come to mind for you? Not that I can think of at the minute. Great. Well, thank you. I'm I'm curious. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. I hope you can stay on, and I'm sure something else will come up. Um, for attendees, if there's, I'm just curious is if this is something that are you like at the point where you're ready to write a grant or are you more in the dreaming stage or where, where are you at in your trail gathering process? Are you dreaming? Are you planning? Are you implementing? Where are you at? Love to see that in the chat if you can. Anne Marie Robinson is dreaming. Can they? Oh, good job. Great. I was going to say, can they add their um, community? Oh, yeah, your community. Anne Marie, I think Anne Marie is in, I think she's in Helena. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, Shea. So Shea, dreaming, gathering information here in Geraldine. There you go, Geraldine. Awesome. Love to hear that. And Anne Marie is in Helena. Yes. Oh, Shea, I'm so, you just made my day knowing that you're in Geraldine working on trails. Chiara is in Whitehall. There's just a little buzz to get a trail over by the Western Legacy Center in Whitehall. So that goes from the main part of town under the underpass, I'm thinking, across to the north side of um, the interstate. Very cool. Love it. Michelle Anderson is in Boulder, and she's saying since we have a start, the dream is being worked towards. So, so past dreaming to working on implementation. Hopefully they can get some support to see it through. Love to hear it. Okay, well, keep on entering if you can. Um, entering where you're at, if you're where you're at in the process. And with that, I'm going to um, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Diane Conradi, and Diane is with the Montana Access Project, and I think you're the founder. Um, Diane is going to discuss her work in creating a technical assistance program for rural communities for getting more access to trail and outdoor recreation. And Diane is coming to us straight from a, a planners conference. So that's, um, so she's, I uh, appreciate you making it work for us, Diane. We're excited to hear from you. Um, and we're getting some more comments here. So Debbie from Boulder is, they're working to get it on track. Um, they have a trail completed and they need the next idea. I love that. Okay, Diane, take it away. Let's see how your sound works. No, shoot. Can you there? Can you, yeah. Can you, can you see me? Yeah, we can see you and we can hear you. So maybe talk loud. All right. It's a little quiet. Okay. I'm, I'm having to, uh, can you hear me? Let me see. Um, I'm having technical difficulties. Can you hear me? Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I am actually at a planning conference right now with planners, probably for many of your communities who are struggling with how to get connected paths and trails in their communities. And, um, you know, Tom, I work with Tom frequently and, um, he was part of a program that I'm going to, um, share with you, but, um, you know, I'm just going to say from the start, this is not part of my presentation. It's hard. I mean, don't think for a minute it's easy because it isn't. Um, every bit of it is hard. Starting it is hard. Building it is hard. Maintaining it is hard. Funding it is hard. Keeping it going is hard. And you know what? It's absolutely worth it. It, but seeing the joy of, of little kids riding their strider bikes, um, getting out, getting some fresh air, getting some exercise. It's, um, it's just absolutely worth it. So keep at it. All of you, everyone. Um, I'm going to, um, see if I can share my screen. Uh, believe it or not, I'm trying this with, uh, my iPhone. Um, can you see this um, weird slide that has half of it blocked out? Yeah, I'm impressed, Diane. Oh yeah. my gosh, I cannot believe I'm doing this. Okay, so I am. Who ever thought that we'd be sitting here with these small devices doing, um, you know, all this work? All right, so I'm doing this on my phone, so it's not showing up um, well. But what I wanted to talk about um, is resilient outdoor communities. And I use the word outdoor instead of outdoor recreation because a lot of the values that we share and value in our communities are, they're not just recreation. It's clean water, clean air, vistas, wildlife, hunting, angling, dispersed recreation, um, it, it, it's not just recreation per se. So I like to use the term outdoor communities because it captures whatever people want as the importance of outdoors in their lives. Um, and I'll tell a little bit about um, uh, but having this, now let me just say this, having this slide like be all on the screen is beyond my technical capability. Okay. So, um, so, um, just to introduce myself, I am the founder and CEO of Montana access project. I am an attorney and a front country recreation fanatic. I love, um, building and, um, building recreation systems in communities and, um, I'm obsessed with it. So I like to help. I, I like to help advance what we're doing in Whitefish, but I also like um, sharing lessons learned, experience and expertise with others. I work closely with Kate McMahon, who is a, been a land use planner for 35 years. She's a great thinker, great writer, and um, we have both worked together on um, the Whitefish Trail, and we've learned a lot of lessons that we're trying to package up and share with, with other rural, particularly rural communities. So our key principles is that we abide by in our work is um, we're by rural for rural. You know, we're not out of Salt Lake and Denver and San Francisco and Seattle. Um, we we um, believe in outdoor communities, which are recreation plus economy plus. Like it's not just about economic impact. It's not just about getting recreation systems. It's about how all of it fits together to advance um, health and wellness and community vitality in every community. Um, we bring expertise and experience. Um, we've both been there, done that. So we, we have the practical, you know, knowledge to share. We do, we like to do with and not for. We we don't, we're not just the ones where you hand a project and give you something and hand it back. Like we, we 
are committed to figure out ways to stand with communities in achieving what they need to, to get it done. Like Tom said, it, it ties in nicely with, um, you know, with what he can do, because he can sort of guide you in the right direction, but sometimes you need help in, sure, you get the money, but how do you get it on the ground? How do you maintain it? How do, you're having this problem, you're having that problem, you've got user conflicts, you've got this, and et cetera. Um, we meet communities where they're at, and we absolutely believe that there should be a nature-based experience for everyone every day in every community. So an outdoor community to me means a community that invests in places for people to access nature to support economic and community vitality. I kind of explained that. Uh, here's a picture of Butte and I'm in Butte right now. Um, you know, when you look at the impacts of outdoor recreation, um, yes, there is the economic impact. Um, and if you wanna, you know, bake that out a little bit. It's it's regional economic development, but it's also worker and business recruitment. If you look at the ads for a lot of these tech companies and companies for recruiting people um, to work, it they're shopping the outdoor recreation experiences. And most people that move here, they kind of want to be able to do that every day. They don't want to have to drive 50 miles or 100 miles. Yes, they will for the weekend trip or the week long trip. But you know that everyday access to nature is really important. Um, sustainable tourism development. Um, you know, I like to think that we, what we've done in Whitefish is we have created an amenity for ourselves, and we're willing to share it with others, which we do, um, and that results in an economic impact. But um, but it's really uh, when that sustainability piece means it works for the communities where people are visiting. Um, of course, we all know about the health and wellness, and there's also a trend, which I learned about from Tara, which is called brain gain. And it's kids are moving away and they want to move back. Um, so, you know, having ample quality inspired outdoor recreation access is a big part of that. Um, I use this slide to just sort of show that outdoor recreation uh, co contributes to the economy in so many ways beyond just tourism. I mean, there's re recreation investment income, there's tax revenue, there's talent uh, recruitment, which we've already talked about. There are, you know, healthier lifestyles. Um, you get manufacturing companies that come in like the, you know, hunting and angling companies um, and, you know, new residents that that refresh our communities. And Tara can also talk about that, that um, folks want to, you know, um, move and, and have a quality lifestyle. So just to give you an example of an economic impact, um, I wish I could put this slide on here. In 2018, um, Headwaters Economics did a just, you know, just a snapshot of economy is uh, they did a, an economic impact study of the ripple effect of the whitefish trail. Now, mind you, we're a resort community. We are get a ton of pressure from Glacier. We get a lot of, you know, Glacier visitors. But I just want to highlight that $6.4 million of annual consumer spending and 68 jobs are supported by, by visitors to the Whitefish Trail. So that's, I mean, that's not just Glacier. That's in addition to Glacier. Um, and we, we get a lot of users. We get a lot of local users, mostly local users. I think it shows, see, it's 50%, it's, two, it's three quarters are local users and a quarter are visitors. So, um, I think Helena has a similar study that shows 4.4 million, um, you know, annual revenue. And that's, that's bikes, it's people staying longer, it's people eating in restaurants, it's people staying in hotels, but it's also locals buying bikes and locals buying gear and locals, you know, uh, using the trail. Um, we all know the wellness benefits of getting out into nature. Um, there's physical wellness, mental wellness, 
and just general, you know, community wellness. I, I know you all know about that, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but um, that's a benefit in addition to the economy. And then finally, it's that other part of the outdoor environment that's not just the trail. It's climate resilience, it's heritage, it's clean water, clean air, it's scenic vistas, it's abundant wildlife. Um, you know, that's what the outdoors brings to our communities. And yes, having great places that are well maintained to get out into that is great. Um, but also know that there's there's just that value in and of itself. Um, Tom probably talked about this, but I'll reiterate, you know, the challenges for rural communities are particularly for those kinds of amenities that are close close to towns is there's a patchwork of public and private landowners. I mean, there when you look at towns, there's kind of a donut of private land around towns. So if you're looking at, you know, close in recreation, a lot of times you're going to have to work with you're going to work with private landowners and you're going to work with with um, Montana Department of Transportation. Um, you know, another challenge is there's minimal professional staffing, which which Tara just mentioned. I mean, there's um, it's it's um, we don't have a lot of, not a lot of parks departments, parks and rec departments. Um, you know, nonprofits may be based out of Bozeman or Helena or somewhere else that's not in your community. They may be serving your community, but um, but you know, there's not a lot of professional staffing. Um, heavy reliance on partnerships and volunteers, and we all know the same three people do all the stuff. Um, there are scarce resources, competing priorities, particularly in local government. Um, it's often you know snow plowing and and uh, snow plowing and road repair are the priorities over um, trails and recreation experience. And there's a disconnect with funding priorities, um, both at the state level and um, and at the local level. So the way we at Montana Access Project supports local communities is um, we help with planning, we help with strong partnerships, and we help with support. You know, building capacity in rural communities. Um, one of the ways we do that is a partnership that we have with the um, I, I can't make this slide all on one thing, but we have worked with the University of Montana to come up with a um, community led sort of do it yourself planning um, experience that will help a community get people together and figure out what your highest priorities are. Um, it's it's a it, we've just done two communities as a pilot project. One is was White Sulphur Springs and one is Columbia Falls. It's really to 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 use it's a tool to use to you know get people together and get some um, commonality around a priority project and then identify some action steps that you need to do to get it going forward. Um, sometimes just the momentum of getting something done then inspires and and snowballs into doing other larger projects. But we all know that particularly for shared use paths and anything having to do with Montana Department of Transportation is really expensive and really difficult. So um, but there are also, you know, some low hanging fruit that can come forward to be able to get shaped out, supported and fed into a program like the one that Tom talked about with the grant funding program where you have a shovel ready project, meaning you, you know, who's going to build it, you know, how to build it and you know how to maintain it. So, our 1st, 2 communities were uh, white sulfur springs and Columbia falls. And each of those are, are really different communities. Um, both of our rural and both have uh, no, you know, real planning or uh, excuse me, parks and rec. Um, so through the core process, um, some of the recommendations that we learned from that first round of, of efforts that we did with, um, with those two communities are 
to involve multiple generations, like really get people involved, not just retirees, but get kids involved, get schools involved. Um, White Sulphur Springs had kids that wanted to participate in the planning process. And I'm not gonna lie, there was some, there was some hesitancy to that um, from some of the, some of the leaders and um, they ended up really because they, they thought the kids weren't going to participate or they were just going to you know pop in and pop out and they really didn't they really stuck with it they had some great ideas that would have never had occurred to um, a lot of folks who were sitting at the table and who were on the committees and on the city council and on the city committees so it was it was really a cool experience um you know have a plan before you plan so yeah think it through Invite the right people to the table, get the, get the right movers and shakers, um, go beyond the standard movers and shakers and just find people who, who really want to roll up their sleeves. Um, define the timeline, identify a leader, um, find out from other similar communities what they've learned. There are so many great lessons out there and that's why reimagining rural is so important and um, to create a network for uh, rural communities to talk to each other, because yes, there are differences and yes, there are similarities. And finally, you know, have it be fun and not just a, a talk fest at, at, uh, at these meetings. Um, at MAP, we really believe in vision and planning. Um, we, we were, tr we're true believers in that. A lot of people want to just stick a shovel in the ground, but we have found that by um, taking the time to really kind of think it through, you're, play you're playing the long game, which you have to play to be able to make meaningful change on the ground. So for a, pl a project that is ready for uh, planning like Tom's, there's a whole pipeline of people and thought and effort that goes into it that's going to require for it to succeed in the long term. Um, you know, it, that that planning effort inspires commitment, it builds relationships, it integrates with other official plans like growth policies or SEDs or community economic development plans or, you know, other kinds of community plans that plugs into those. Um, which all of which um, increase the competitiveness for these projects with uh, for funding and builds community support. Diane, we're yeah, we're, we have just one minute left. <laughs> oh, one minute. Okay. So what we do is um, we do um, one thing. We do is uh, if you're ready to get de deeper and get broader, we do um, recreation. Um, action plans that look, engage the community, identify your key assets and build implementation plans. Um, the other thing that I'm excited about, it's coming soon, is our community, outdoor community lab. And we'll be working with partners like Heart of the Rockies to do a get grant ready workshop, um, which is precisely what the last question was, was how do we get, how do we get our project ready? So this is precisely for those people who have an idea, they need to get it on paper, they need to get it baked out, and they need to get it ready for programs like the ones that Tom talked about and others. Um, we w watch out for that. Maybe uh, Tara can push that through when we schedule those. And the uh, second part of that will be, we'll do, be doing some coaching, which is, you know, if you're stuck, if you need to get to the next level, um, we'll have a variety of experts available to you, and we can also do one-on-one um, -on -one helping. Get think it through, get it funded, get it get it going um, to build infrastructure, operations management, sus um, sustainable capacity, and that's what we do. Excellent, Diane. Okay, you got it pitch the outdoor recreation oh, okay. summit. <laughs> um, uh, Tara is going to be one of our speakers um, to, uh, we've got an outdoor recreation su summit coming up in Butte from October 11th to the 13th. 
it's going to be an amazing gathering um, that will focus on it's really focuses on rural communities, but how to increase access, diversity, equity, how to balance recreation and conservation, how to have the economic um, impacts, sustainable economic impacts of outdoor recreation. And um, it's just a really remarkable uh, cast of characters that's going to be um, sharing knowledge and networking. So I would encourage all of you to sign up. Yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Diane, for making it work while you're out also uh, connecting with uh, planners from Montana, which is essential. So um, I hope you I will all say got we, some. Yeah. We, all, we talked exactly about this topic. Um, we had a legislator that talked about how to um, how to remedy some of these issues, and it was I, I could have continued the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we are out of time. I just before we go, I want to just thank our panelists so much. I really appreciate you sharing all of your expertise, all the all the knowledge that you've gained along the way. We're so thankful to have have you on this uh, this session. We will share a recording. If I can get uh, the slides from the presenters, I'll share those as well. And uh, we're um, next month. We're planning on having seeing our application process is opening, and we'll talk about what some towns have accomplished and how you might apply. How how very easy it is to apply. Jennifer, do you have any closing comments before we wrap it up? You know, not a lot. I just think it's interesting every time we have one of these and it, it just seems to me, I think, um, Ben hit it the nail on the head. Like that is the purpose of reimagining rural is the network. It's to bring a network of rural communities together because we have so many similar. Yes, we have differences, but we have so many similarities and it's to share our knowledge and experiences so that we can all um, maybe do more in our small towns. And so it's just wonderful to see folks on here and to learn about um, a small small towns that are making things happen. So really appreciate that. Yeah, great. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming and uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. And thanks again to our speakers.